Hi, it's Dr. Steve Steele again. And today we're going to look at applying research methods. Now, don't you love it when somebody call, talks to you and says, hey, this is what you shouldn't do? Well, I'm going to start out with that. What you shouldn't do is let this video stand in the way of a really great research methods course. You got to take one, you got to spend some time with it, and you actually have to do the research to really understand it. It's not going to be covered in a 10 minute video, I promise. And it's a life's work for some people. That having been said, well, let's take a look at how we might use research methods and processes when we're applying sociology. Now, now first, you've got to go back and you've got to ask yourself, all right, I know I talked about the scientific method somewhere. And yeah, it's important and we're going to do that again. Uh, in, in this sense, we have to ask ourselves, uh, whether it's intro to SOCH or intro to psych or any introduction to any science, I mean any science that uses the scientific method, hence, uh, just what are you doing? Usually this has at least five steps. Sometimes people say eight, sometimes seven, but it's at least five. And usually that starts out with the notion of some statement of a problem. Now this problem can be descriptive, saying what is it? Exploratory, saying, oh, I need to know about it. How does it work? Tell me about that. And then explanatory, trying to come up with some sort of explanation for why something happens. Now, usually that's a hypothesis test. Um, when we do that, then after that statement of the problem, the first thing, whether we try to categorize it as one of those things, has an impact on just how we'll design the research. The next step down is looking at some sort of research design. Okay. So you're going to try to explore something, let's say. How are you going to set up this research thing so that it makes some sense, so that we can actively get some good results, some valid and reliable results about the thing we're trying to look at? Thirdly, then, we're going to go out and use that research design to collect some data. And we're going to have to make some observations or get data from another source or primary data, which we collect on the first hand or secondary data, some data used by somebody else. And then we're going to analyze it. You know, having a pile of, of questionnaires or an electronic set of, of surveys and survey data uh, doesn't tell us a whole lot unless we can actually sort of look for some inher inherent patterns in it. I mean, that's really what sociologists try to do. They try to link that statement of the problem in research design with some patterns of outcome in the analysis. Uh, what basically did we see or not see? Because sometimes negative results, that is, it, that is to say, results that are not in line with your statement of the problem, are even better than positive results, ones that support it. And then last but not least, we're going to draw some conclusions for this, and we're going to then submit our thinking and our research to somebody. In an applied setting, okay, this contrasts with basic or theoretical research in that we're going to submit these results to a client usually. It's often somebody who's paying for the research so that they can solve a problem. Now, in basic research, people pay for it, but they may be interested in some theoretical concern. They want to know well, why something happens so that it can support or not support theoretical view. But in applied settings, clients are going to want to know, okay, what'd you find out? All right. And do you have any recommendations maybe on how we can use it? And that's a little bit different sort of stuff. Um, in fact, very often when I start looking at applied problems and working with client-based problems, my first step isn't a statement of the problem. My first step is understanding the client, the client's situation, and then maybe even looking at a couple of ethical issues to see whether or not I actually want to work for this person or not, or with this company, or uh, are there things there and uses this research that you know I may not feel comfortable with. That having been said, I also want to find out about that company because I want to understand its culture. I want to know its way of life because that way of life may have some incredible impacts on whether or not I can collect any data at all or make any observations. So it's important to um, start out by asking yourself, what about the client? Who's the client? What's the environment I'm working in? 
very often, I'm in, I'm in situations, and applied sociologists are in situations where they're doing research in areas that they may not, may not know a whole lot about. Uh, and it's not always the greatest thing. You might want to get a specialist for that. But on the other hand, it's, it's not impossible. And uh, sometimes you can, you can actually become a quick self-study on a corporation's uh, situation, the products that they produce, the way they do it, uh, their general mode of, of working their general way of life in the, oper in the organization. So there's a contrast there between basic and applied research methods. And of course, unlike, not unlike any research, um, there are quantitative and qualitative approaches. Now just briefly, as you remember, the quantitative approach is a kind of reductionist. That is to say, it reduces concepts to measurements. And remember, a measurement is simply putting a number on something Okay, for the purpose of, of trying to understand it, measure it, uh, and then ultimately go through the analysis and conclusions phase. In, in, in a sense, the quantitative approach says if we can break things down in their pieces and measure them, and then sort of add them back up, we can understand them. Qualitative work, on the other hand, uh, is a situation in which people sort of say, look, if, if something exists, it is what it is. You really shouldn't take it apart. And so in order to understand it, you really have to um, actually understand it in a sort of what they call holistic way. you got to understand the whole thing. You can't break it down because once you break it down, you lose what it is. Okay, so those are kind of competing, uh, competing views. All that having been said, in an applied setting, whether you're doing applied, public, or clinic, clinical sociologists, sociology, excuse me, you, what you end up doing is, you know, I use, or we use, uh, both those tools. The big question in quantitative and qualitative research methods for applied work is not which one is, only, is right for all time, but which of the qualitative and quantitative, or both, research methods work for us to get the best understanding of our client's problem. And hence, we may want to do a quantitative uh, telephone survey or an online survey, which is quantitative, of our clients' employees, for example. But then, in order to better understand the results on those surveys, we might want to do some focus groups, which are qualitative. Now, which should we use? Both. We should use whichever we can to get a better picture of that understanding. Now, of course, one of the things that we're guided by in terms of quantitative and qualitative tools that may be a little bit different in an applied setting is there's a very arbitrary sort of amount of money that people want to pay. You're sometimes restricted by several things. The money that people want to pay for the research, your client wants to pay for the research, the access to uh, the research subjects or entities, and time constraints. Um, this research project may not be able to go on and on and on, whether it's quantitative or qualitative. A client needs results, and she needs them in a way that she can understand them on time and hopefully under cost. So you get some other issues here that you may not think of quite as much in a basic setting. Now, there's always this concern. What about objectivity in, res in social research? And can there really be objectivity in research of human beings? This raises its head in, in using applied research methods. And very often what ends up happening is that uh, people who you're observing in, a, say, a company or a, a hospital or, uh, or in a community setting, once they know you're a researcher, uh, they'll be saying, hey, the researcher's here. Well, that's, that's hard, hardly objective. Now you're on the site. And we're, we're getting some things that sociologists often call design effects. The way you organize the research has had now have an impact on the out outcome. It's pretty tough sometimes to imagine that you can be totally objective, particularly when you're in an applied setting. But you do the best you can because, in a sense, what you want to do is give your client the best honest information that you can about the organization structures or whatever it happens to be that you're looking at or processes. And it's important in social research. On the other hand, sometimes it turns out that some of the best information you can get comes from not being objective at all. 
comes from being subjectively engaged in the social setting. And this will go back to our, our quantitative qualitative dichotomy again, which is really not a dichotomy in my world, but just a toolbox. And it goes something like this. As it, you know, as it turns out, uh, we may find out that in a quantitative or a qualitative setting, uh, we're, we're able to use these research methods in ways that will improve the life of people while we're engaged in the research process. Now, would that be wrong? Well, may not be research, might be something else, but then we start to consider, all right, so what is the client paying for here? Uh, and the concern over objectivity uh, becomes an issue unto itself. There's this whole issue about, quote, going native that worries many anthropologists, and it certainly worries many applied sociologists. When you're working closely with the, the people or the organizations that you're, you're uh, uh, studying and trying to use your applied ability, uh, you may be very much tied or not tied to their values and hence want to help out in ways other than doing research. You've got to be concerned about that and to what degree do you want the results to work one way or another. And this goes back to our issue about thinking objectively in terms of the research of human beings. And it also takes us back to the quantitative qualitative concern. Very simply stated, in the quantitative world, we create instruments, surveys, observation scales, you name it, to measure our problem. In a qualitative research setting, the researcher is often the measurement scale. The human in a focus group or uh, in a participant observation study is in fact the instrument by which information is collected. We don't necessarily in that setting put ourselves separate from the environment that we're observing. It's a challenge because how do you know what you're seeing in that environment is really what's going on, or, or have you in some way been biased by what you see? It's worth a thought. Well, again, this is only the beginning of thinking about applying research. I hope you'll take a research methods course and really enjoy this stuff. I've found in my life that, the, that uh, research is not only a kind of cold and pragmatic kind of situation in which you know you have to apply these very cold tools. What I found is that uh, the reality is that there was never a simple textbook solution to any applied research problem I've ever engaged. So creativity is a must and knowing about quantitative and qualitative tools in the research process as a fundamental way of thinking about this is absolutely essential. Have a good one. <laughs>